worked in collegiate athletics. And when we talk about financial freedom and, and making kind of money without your time, something had to change because burnout was definitely fast approaching. When I was a young coach, I think I was 23 at the time, I, I got my first cash flowing rental, like your classic student rental, 70K, rented for a thousand bucks. And that thing started making me $300, $350 a month of, of profits. And then I just started parlaying that um, real estate cash flow into something that led me into vending machines years later. Okay, starting with the real estate game, and, and I'm impressed that you're able to save enough for a down payment on that salary to uh, to make the uh, investment property purchase. But then, so why not continue down the real estate path, or like, or looking at a vending machine as like a micro piece of real estate? Like, where where's the um, where's the transition come? With rentals, I was tired of the the twenty to twenty five percent down payment that these banks would require me to do. It just didn't make sense after a while of constantly having to try try to find 20 to 25 percent to put down so at some point i needed to find an income stream that um, required minimal capital which obviously vending uh requires very minimal capital compared to real estate and then the same thing is you know real estate isn't necessarily passive there's definitely things you can do to make it passive with the right property managers and stuff but you know if a vending machine goes empty you're not getting calls like you would when, you know, a pipe breaks in the bathroom of your rental. So um, that's kind of why I made the the transition to more uh, vending and, and things of that nature um, that I could make more passive and, and less urgent. Yeah, it's an interesting comparison to draw. Like, hey, I was, I was cash flowing 350 bucks a month, but it required this huge down payment. Plus, it's got all this liability. Plus, it's got all this maintenance. And yeah, you got to stock the vending machine. But I imagine one machine in a right location could probably make you 350 bucks a month, like for a much lower upfront cost, just like lower headache involved. Absolutely. I mean, I have any machines that do more than my rentals, whether that's my long-term rentals or my short-term Airbnbs. Um, Food and water are are necessities. And that's why Warren Buffett said his first vending machines when he was a teenager were the best investment he ever made. And he actually regrets selling his vending route when he was young and uh, trying to get a quick buck, but um, you're spot on with that. And then the risk is way lower. Like if a vending machine runs out where there's a malfunction, it's not yeah. the equivalent of your toilet breaking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's helpful. <laughs> helpful to know. You put it in perspective. And so what, so what happens next? So if I, if you're coaching me and I say like, okay, I'm, I'm interested, or, you know, what, what's my first move? I start like looking for, uh, apartment buildings, office buildings. I, I don't even know where where to start looking for to find a placement. First step is like, think of those places you drive by. Think of the gym you go to. Think of that office building where your bank teller is in the first floor. They got doctor's offices in the second, lawyers in the third, blah, blah, blah. Like yeah. anywhere with a lot of foot traffic and just go start having a conversation. The great thing post COVID is there's no free refreshments in the lobby anymore. So these robots that you talked about, these vending machines are in a high demand that they want the latest modern machines. They don't want the old school, you know, very cumbersome looking ones you see at the airport that are just getting replaced with nicer luxury amenities. Yeah. What was it for you? So I like this idea of like pre-selling it first, like before you you stock your garage full of uh, machines and snacks, you go, go find a place to put it. Um, what what did that conversation look like for you? Well, I think the first conversation, which is really interesting, is my background's in human performance and living longer and being healthier. And so I actually went to a couple apartments where there were a lot of athletes I lived at. And yeah. I asked the manager, like, hey, do you guys have vending machines? Do you have healthy options? Because I was genuinely worried about the recovery for these athletes with the right nutrition. And they were like, no, Mike, we're we need vending machines. Can you provide them? And keep in mind, Nick, this is pre-COVID. I didn't even know where to look on Google for vending machines. So I was like, yeah, "Yeah, absolutely. I can do that. So then I just kind of self-figured it out from there. Yeah. The the confidence to say, yeah, yeah, totally. I could totally do that. (laughs) Got to go figure that out. Um, Okay. So trying to find kind of like high density populated, either office buildings or residential buildings that don't have something in place already. And the question that comes to mind for me is like, well, why isn't 
the building owner or the property manager like how how is nobody else doing this like why aren't they interested in doing it why did why did they say yeah can you do that for us the biggest answer to that is it's not high enough on the the priority of their to-do list perfect example of that is i'm talking to marriott corporate right now out of the northeast about doing a potentially at large rollout with all of their courtyards across the U.S. and Canada. And they already have these little micro markets and their hotels, but they're tired of the human error element of relying on their staff to restock them, relying on their staff to do room charges because people have to wait at the front desk. So again, that human error piece to this where when you come with a proposal, it's like, oh, I can outsource this. I don't even have to worry about it because at the end of the day, if you have an empty vending machine or an empty micro market, there's nothing worse than not having it than having it and it's empty. Because now your residents or your tenants expect, hey, I want to go buy and get my energy drink before work today. Well, when it hasn't been stocked for three weeks, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the property manager and complain. Okay. So it's not, it, your argument is that it's, it's not core to their business in the no. case of the hotels. And so they're just like, you know, who... Who cares about selling a three dollar and fifty cent thing where we're charging three hundred dollars a night for the room? Like, just it's it's a distraction, and it it's it's just if, if somebody else could take it off our hands, like that would be a welcome yeah. conversation. I mean, a perfect example of this is there's a national vending brand that um, when we started to become a national thing with vending pros in the community that I got exposed to, and we were taking a lot of their business, and I was like, I wonder why these locations you mentioned with the high foot traffic, why they're not happy with these guys. Well, these guys got into food catering too. So they were doing vending and food catering. So think of a senior citizen center. If I'm a, a vending company coming in and I'm also providing all of the Pepsi or soda kegs for the cafeteria, all the food for the cafeteria, do you think I'm really focused on the vending machine down in the hallway that just needs a top off with snacks that might do $1,500 a month where this cafeteria is going to blow through $1,500 a product a day? Okay. Okay. So you get your first yes from this uh, apartment building, this athlete or student apartment building. Uh, and then you start looking, well, how am I going to get a, a machine? Like walk me through what happens after that. I literally Google vending machines. You kind of got two routes here. You got the, you go down the used path, look on places like marketplace and Craigslist and even local refurbished type places like appliance type places. And then you got these new places and the best analogy I would use is a, a new vending machine manufacturer is very similar to a car dealership. So I called them up. They're like, all right, Mike, the machine you want, it's going to be about $5,500. Do you want to pay for it up front or do you want to finance it with zero money down? And I was like, okay, tell me about your financing options. They're like, oh, we can do it over 60 months. You can use profits to pay them off early. And every single one now I finance with zero money down. And I'm, I typically have them paid off in the first year just with profits. Okay. And that's like the real estate mindset of leveraging other people's capital yeah. versus, you know, coming up Good with a hundred percent down payment. Yeah. And this is back to the, like, when I bought that hundred grand house, I had to put 20% down and that just wasn't sustainable every single rental. So this is where with vending, I just bought 18 grand worth of vending machines, I think in October, and I didn't put a dollar down. And the benefit there is that you got something brand new because I'm I'm on uh, Facebook Marketplace, of course. Like, well, shoot, what what's available near me? You know, yeah. from the five hundred to a thousand dollar range, it looks like for some drink machines. Okay, a little bit more than that for like the combo machines or the snack machines. I don't know how old they are. I don't know if they have card readers, but you there's there's options if you want to minimize the upfront, uh, you know, sticker price of these things too. There's definitely options. I, I got my first machine used and then it broke after six months. And I was like, I never want to do that again. I don't want to be a machine mechanic. None of that stuff. I just want this thing to run it. Uh, are they like relatively reliable? Like, to what extent do you have to know the, the fixing game or you, do you have a, you know, a go-to vending machine fixer person that you can call like if something does break? Yeah, that's why. So ever since that first one I got off Craigslist broke, I've only bought new ever since. And so they're under warranty. So if anything were to ever, I mean, you got to keep in mind, these things are, have been around for decades. So they're built to last. I mean, we're yeah. talking 20 years plus. Um, so they constantly are, are um, built to be robust and to be used. So um, if I I'd ever have an issue because mine are under warranty, I just FaceTime them when I'm at the machine. 
they do their little troubleshooting thing. If there's any issues, they just overnight me apart. And like I said, I don't want to be the mechanic. Yeah, that becomes a little bit less passive at that point. All right, exactly. so. So walk me through the math here. So new machine, 5,500, you're financing that over a period of several years. What's the typical payment? So typical payment is right now with interest rates are around 170 bucks a month. Your first payment isn't due until 90 days after it's installed on site. So you're going to do 90 days of revenue before your first $170 payments due. Um, and then it's $170 a month typically, and that's just based on today's rates and let's just say eight to nine percent i don't know sure sure ones from yeah four years ago that my payments are 112 dollars. so they're definitely a little variable there um and then yeah you can just use uh profits to pay those off of those machines i just i uh, used as an example that are 170 bucks a month um i mean we had one in january that just did over 1500 dollars Okay, fifteen dollars in revenue minus your uh, cost of product. You know, you aim for a I don't know what, like a three X markup, like stuff in vending machines. It's not cheap. It's like you pay for exactly. the convenience. Yep. yep. So um, typically we'll be around thirty five, forty percent. So let's just shoot high on expenses. Let's say forty percent of fifteen hundred bucks. So what's that? Six fifty, seven hundred dollars in in cost of goods. Okay, so we'll call it eight hundred in in profit on that. $1,500 a month? Yep. Okay. Yeah, minus your 170 in payment, and you're still in the black uh, pretty healthily, and you pay it off faster if you don't like paying interest, and you can parlay that into the next machine, next location. Okay, so you're starting to, starting to see how this can work out, and you have so far minimized your, your overhead. Anything else like would, that would go into that? Like, do you have to like pay electricity or like you have to pay you know over yeah. you got to pay a percentage to the plate like to, to rent this little like six square foot place in their building or something i hire someone to, to stock the machine so if anyone needs to like place an ad on craigslist you can place a, a job ad on, um like under gigs so it doesn't matter if they stock in the morning or night because they're a night owl it doesn't matter they just need to do it let's say once a week um and that's about 20 bucks an hour so let's say Let's just say thirty dollars a week, even though it takes a half hour to stock a machine. So let's just say twenty bucks for easy math. Um, so we got twenty bucks an hour. That's eighty bucks. Um, so you got seven hundred dollars in cogs, hundred and seventy dollar machine payment. And then if you don't want to stock yourself and you want to make it truly passive, you're going to spend another eighty to a hundred dollars um, for someone to stock that machine. Gotcha. Yeah, and then. Well, lather, rinse, repeat as many times yeah. uh, as you can or as many locations as you can find. And you're up to 10, 15 at this point? And added other kind of back to the modern thing of what people, people want to fill occupancy, whether that's offices getting people back in the door for work and away from their remote life, or whether that's um, these luxury apartments. You've probably seen them way up there, like just being built with all these crazy amenities from saunas to to outdoor pools and everything in between. Um, you know, we've added cold brew machines now. We've added micro markets, which look like unintended self-checkout 7-Elevens on site. So that's kind of the parlay thing there where now instead of just the candy bar, the sandwich, or the, sorry, the candy bar, the soda, and the vending machine, now you can start adding things like toilet paper. You can add things like phone chargers. You can add things like subs and salads. And now our average transaction value just went from two to three dollars to twelve to fifteen dollars. Yeah, and you, well, with each of those, and now you got to worry about like food spoilage and turnover and stuff. Where it's like, yeah, it's less of an issue with a uh, you know a candy bar or a, a bottle of water or something. But um, so this because I've seen these at the airports where it's like you know full like you know several racks of mm -hmm. different products, and then there's no like no checkout person, just like self. Your honor yeah. system, like self checkout, yeah. and it's like it just there's enough people walking by to prevent theft or you know security cameras. Like, uh, we, do you find that sh inventory shrinkage is is an issue here nowadays with these some of these cameras? So all those will have cameras that you were at, um, but these cameras now will alert you. Like if you don't, if you grab an item and like there's AI and machine learning cameras now that if you don't grab that item and go over to the kiosk, it'll actually shout out something 
out of the camera to you, like almost like a, uh, a horn of like, hey, you didn't pay for your item. And now you're sitting in the terminal of the airport and everyone's staring at you shoplifting. So there's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's all kinds of things. And then the other side is like a lot of these, where it's going now is like that cooler you grab that Dr. Pepper out of. It's going to have cameras built into the inside of the cooler. So if you take out five Dr. Peppers, you don't even have to scan it anymore. It'll just because there's a lock to get open the cooler. So when Nick comes by that cooler, he has to put his credit card to yeah. unlock the door. And then if he takes five Dr. Peppers, he doesn't have to scan on that lock. He can just grab them and it's going to charge that because of the cameras. We'll use machine vision and calculate that you just took five Dr. Peppers. So we see this all the time with like drunk college students where we have these modern coolers they'll like think they're 2 a.m having the munchies and getting away with taking 20 things and we're talking 90 to 100 dollar transaction <laughs> so they wake up next week and they find the find the yeah. uh, transaction charge on there yeah. like all those bags of chips they just thought they snagged when they were hammered are totally now, worth it they're, they're Okay, so uh, I'm getting a sense of well, what what demographic do I want to target here? Yes, impulse yeah. impulse purchases, late night. Okay, uh, with the protections in place to prevent the uh, the shoplifting. So, okay, so if I can picture like a senior center down the road from us. There's got to be some nearby, uh, you know, apartment buildings. Like, how do you know how, how do I find the decision maker there? What does that like initial conversation look like? What's 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 my opener? It's super easy. I think the first thing is uh, the examples you just rattled off. So senior center and let's say an apartment complex. The thing they all have in common is they have a front desk person that works there. Okay. So you can just roll right in there. They're not going to know you from anyone else. And you're going to say, hey, is your general manager or your property manager in today? And if she's like, oh, no, you can always uh, ask for the business card and, and send an email. But um yeah, that's exactly what I did that first location I landed. I was like, hey, is your manager in? And she happened to be in. She's like, oh, my gosh, coming, you know, with COVID, we can't put out refreshments, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we want to move forward. And um, it's just such a low barrier to entry by just doing that pop in. And your your ask was like, tell me about your current vending situation. Like, what's the, what's that line? Yeah, or just like, do you want to provide modern amenities? And then you just start asking questions about foot traffic to qualify them. So how many people live here um, or how many units are here? And they'll say, okay, Nick, there's 200 units. And then you're like, okay, well, how many people live in those units? Because some might be two or three bedroom. They're like, oh, 400 people. Like right away, you're sitting on, you know, 1,500 to two grand gold mine just with that. Is there a minimum uh, residency or occupancy that you're looking for? Yeah, we like to target 100 units as a minimum or um, 100 plus employees. Okay. 100 residential units or 100 employees. Mm -hmm. And are you finding that, like, it's hard to imagine an office building without this in there already, but you're finding, like, oh, you, you know, Mike, you know what, Mike, we've been in this business, this building has been here for 25 years. No one has ever asked us about vending before. You know, that's a great idea. Like, does that happen? All the time. And in fact, what you'd be really surprised about is we're taking over a lot of the market. So current user, let's say that location, they probably already have vending machines that aren't being stocked because the baby boomer generation doesn't use a cell phone. The only way they can track inventory is driving by the property where like, on my phone across the country, I can look at all my vending machines, even my micro market in Philadelphia, and see what I've done in sales in the last hour. So then I can get ahead of what needs stock before it actually shows up empty customer facing. I'm like, okay, we've sold eight out of 10 salads, we have two left, we need to, to backfill those salads. Where right, right now, these places we're taking over for, they either have vending machines that are broken they have vending machines that don't allow credit card usage. Well, guess what? 80% of your sales are going to be with card, not cash anymore. Yeah. Okay. So that's, so it's not so much that they have never considered vending. It's that their existing provider is is not living up to expectations or, or could be doing better. Yeah. It's like either that existing provider took on a bigger, you know, let's say the, yeah. the Coke provider of Washington has vending as a side service. Well, is that Coke provider more worried about 
topping off the cafeteria with Coke in the school, or are they more worried about the teacher's lounge vending machine? Did you give any thought to, you know, buying a route that already existed mm -hmm. as a way to, you know, kind of jumpstart this? I, I, I can see why, I can see how that would appeal to people, but I can also see like, well, there's a lot of sweat equity to be had and just like, you know, doing the cold calls and making making a few placements yourself. Yeah, so I'm always looking for good deals when it comes to buying routes. Um, I have a student that started in my like vendingpreneur community where I help people get going uh, last January, and he went um, he went from zero machines to twenty machines, and about half of those came from buying uh, routes for sale, and the other half came from you know finding leads, sending cold emails, getting a response, and repeating that on kind of on repeat. So. Um, I see both sides of it. The The hard part you need to be careful of is don't get caught up in how many machines are part of that sale or how many locations they have vending machines in. You want to focus on uh, revenue per machine because that's where a really, like I would rather get one senior center that's doing a thousand bucks a month than five machines at five Jiffy Loops doing a thousand bucks total a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you were... Fewer stops, like fewer places to restock, like exactly. less less headache to manage. Higher, okay, higher revenue. Gotcha. It, and then if if they're like, you know, really low revenue, if you're like, oh, the location looks kind of good, but you know, why is the revenue so low? Like, you know, is it stocked all the time? Does it have a card reader? Like, you start to kind of go through, like, could this be an undervalued asset versus, like, if I was to put in a more modern experience, like, would you know, would it still be? you know, a hundred dollars a month or would it be, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars a month? Like I could see how you could um you know, do some forced appreciation or forced uh improvement to these uh, oh, to these locations. Even just little things like adding a credit card reader or instead of twelve ounce sodas, now you're charging um bottles of soda and instead of a twelve ounce LaCroix, you're doing sixteen ounce monsters. Like people will pay four bucks for a monster, but you're gonna get lucky to get more than a dollar for that LaCroix. So just like Hmm. Even product tweaks are going to increase your revenue somewhere, you know, 4X. On the product side, do you need a special, like, you know, reseller's license? Or can you just, like, roll up to Costco and say, okay, I'm just going to stock from, from what they have here? You can totally roll up to Costco or Sam's Club or, like, out here on the West Coast, you got Winco or just some of those, like, familiar kind of bigger chains, U.S. Foods, for example. Um, and then as far as, like, a reseller's permit, you know, every place is different and Logan or in Oregon, we're pretty, pretty lucky. But like, I do have some of my peers down in like LA County where they need a city and county type permit. Uh, it's not hard. I mean, you just have to fill out a form and then it gets taken care of. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking like, well, yeah. I feel like there, maybe there's like some sales tax exemption or something. If you. Yeah, there you, is. Yeah, because I was like, well, that's where we're at. That's like 10%. It's like, well, that it's Oregon significant margin sales. wise. Yeah, so you get exempt from sales tax. Okay. Um, and then on the product mix, you mentioned a few of these that are hot sellers. <laughs> like anything, anything else that's like surprised you that it's like, dang, I didn't know that this would fly off the shelves once we put it in. Yeah, in fact, there's actually a real world example we're going through right now. And so last week we put in these things called wrap snacks. And I had never heard of them until one of our students in South Carolina put me onto them. Um, but uh, these things are like wrap wrapper snacks. I've never even opened a bag before, but I mean, we get them for I think a dollar twenty three from Sam's Club, and I mean they're shell they're literally selling off the shelf for three fifty like hotcakes. So sixty seven percent margins. Okay, wrap snacks um, yeah. available at Walmart, Target. Amazon near you. I just had yeah. to look those up. I'd never heard of this. Yeah. So I'll look at, yeah. see what that's about. Wrap snacks, like trolley gummy worm. Like a lot of these, if you think of what I call movie theater candy, so a lot of these like big bags of candy you see almost like king size at the movie theater. So trolleys, gummy worms. Um, I mean, you're getting massive margins and increase, you know, trolleys, dollar thirty from Costco selling for four bucks. Um, all kinds of like random, you know, Pop tarts you can get for and ramen, ramen noodles and pop tarts. We oh, get okay. twenty four cents at Costco. We sell them for a dollar fifty. Anyway, we're going through boxes of forty eight of them. Yeah, so you're kind of in that three to 
eight X markup or three yeah. to three to six to X markup, exactly. depending on what it is. Okay. okay, yeah, on a on a per you know per sale basis, you can see how it's really strong. We had a dude, uh, a dude doing uh, ice vending, and his yeah. unit costs were nothing. Like you're bringing like tap water and like filtering it through this machine. It's like, oh yeah, sell it for four bucks a bag. Like yes, that's a, <laughs> an amazing, amazing margin. Um, so not not quite that good, but still still pretty strong. How does it? You know, I, I'm a human performance optimization coach. You know, selling a you know king size thing of Sour Patch Kids. Like, you know, how does that? A lot. I mean, you, you got to go where the demand is. You got to give people what they want. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, uh, you know, you really ought to have some uh, some kale in your life or something, sir. I love this topic because it's like um, human psychology 101. So when we started like that machine that's doing $1,500 a month, when we started pre-COVID with that machine, I had this vision of like uh, cliff bars protein shakes like muscle milk um lacroix is like no sodas no candy bars no snickers no reese's and yeah things are like 300 dollars to start and then you start weaving in like the give and the take so for like every um bag of trolleys if they buy a muscle milk with that like that's a win because previously they were buying a monster so like now yeah. we're doing a lot of these like Celsius and Alani's instead of like your Red Bull and your Monster and your Rockstar. So um, it's totally a, you know, habits don't change overnight, but you got to start somewhere. And that's what like I'm even with our salads, like right now we're trying to really double down on these healthy options. And so, um, you know, we put salads in the market and it, it catered towards the, the people that are used to eating salads. But Nick, you also have the people that are like, in the middle that they just want a sandwich. So now we're doing like these healthy sandwiches that is way healthier than them going across the street to Chick-fil-A or just grabbing chips and a candy bar. Yeah. So it's like that you got to meet them in the middle until they kind of, you can bring them all the way over. Did you have to find a special vendor for the, for that, like fresh food items, the sandwiches, salads, like that's got to be, I imagine pretty locally dependent to stock that. Um, you'd be surprised, like Taylor Farms, if you Costco or Sam's Club or, or any big grocer, like you'll get a lot of the Taylor Farms, like bags and salad. Um, and so you can actually go to Taylor Farms' website and, and type in your zip code and it'll be like, find Taylor Farms salads near me. Um, and there'll be like five to six different options of places you can source things. But my kind of long-term vision is I want local producers of everything. Like I have a a group out of Bend I came across that um, is building energy drinks. So now I'm like, oh man, I would love to add them in instead of Celsius because it's a local brand or like cold brew. I'd love like a local cold brew manufacturer or what, like whatever kind of coffee roaster. But that's my long term vision is everything is sourced locally and healthy. Yeah, even I think there's a big opportunity <laughs> like in non food products. Like you, mm -hmm. you want some vending machine inspiration? Like go to Japan, yeah, you know, like vending machines for for everything. And we saw, um, I remember it was up at five in the morning, cause like with my then three month old because of jet lag. We're like, oh, let's you know strap into the ergo. We'll go for a walk. Oh, iced coffee vending machine for a uh, hundred yen. It's like a dollar. Like sign me, sign me up for that. And uh, we saw. Like Lego uh, vending machine, like huge footprint on this thing, but like a Lego kit vending machine yeah. in the airport. And so it's like, instead of a, you know, $3, $4 transaction, it's like, well, that could be like a $70 transaction. Um, and it's probably some licensing required from, from Lego in that case. But like other other things that you might be able to put in there, depending on location and, and demand, um, they, they, beyond just snacks and food, just like to get to gears turning there. You will, the Lego one fascinates me because you think of that family that's just trying to get their kids through the next flight. And like, there's one in O'Hare in Chicago and that's a Lego machine. And I looked at it one time and I was like, man, people will pay $60 for a Lego set just to keep their kids like occupied, distracted on a three hour flight. Like talk about an impulse buy or whatever, you know, that's what yeah. kind of blew my mind. But I mean, even when you go through the airport now, a lot of these like Apple um stand-ups or a lot of these like sound and headphone stand-ups i mean you can buy pods like what i'm wearing right now you can buy these airpods out of vending machines you can buy 
literally whatever. A vending machine is going to be safer than a retail place when it comes to theft. That's why, um, you know, I envision like a lot of these places that are dealing with a lot of theft, like LA and stuff. Um, who knows? Maybe these retail shops like Lululemon are going to start selling their t-shirts out of a vending machine because they're just going to prevent all the like break-ins and stuff that are happening. Yeah, safer than having cash in a till and yeah, yeah protect your employees. Front-facing store with glass windows, you know, all that. Interesting. So who's on the team now? As you mentioned, I found a, you know, a stalker person, 20 bucks an hour on Craigslist gigs. What, you know, what else is going into this, like management logistics wise? Because it's like, you know, does he come by, he or she come by and grab the, uh, like the product from, Mm -hmm. from you, from some central warehouse? Like how does, how does that all work? So when I first got going before, you know, when I just had a couple locations, I had a little kind of storage thing in the garage. Um, and then I eventually evolved that into like a landscaping garage shed that you can get from Costco. So I had that right on the side of the house. So like I was literally Costco boxes come in, I just carry them over to the garage shed and put them in there. And then when he comes by every Monday to stock, he would just grab the inventory and he's tracking the inventory on his phone. So he knows exactly what he needs to get. Bada boom, bada bing. And then he's off. Um, the other side of this that I'm really kind of doubling down is like lead finding, you know, so, um, we have like a, um, kind of, I built an in-house cold calling team that I help my other vending entrepreneur students grow their routes. So we're constantly dialing into both my leads, but also their leads, um, circling back with people because vending is not a priority. So you just got to stay on their radar. And we see it all the time. We're like, someone pops their head up after 12 months of emails and they're like, oh, we're ready for a vending machine. I'm always like, well, you didn't respond to my emails for 12 months. What was the cause? They're like, oh, we had the ice storm here in Oregon. And someone came to the front desk and complained that they didn't have any, we didn't have anything on site for them. And now it's like, oh, okay. They Googled these emails that were in their inbox and or searched these, you know, and now they want a vending machine. So you never know with life. What yeah, happens. your name is, is top of mind. You thought that was a completely dead lead. But exactly. uh, but you you were planting the seeds like oh you yep. know I'm going to associate when I, whenever that need arises I know who to call. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. So are you actively trying to place more machines locally? You mentioned like so you got the local stuff in Oregon and then you got the micro market in Philadelphia. I think you said like it's interesting because I would have thought this would have to be super localized just from the logistics like stocking standpoint. Yeah, yeah. So we actually found our stalker in Philadelphia off tax, uh, Task Rabbit. Oh, okay. Which, uh, we don't even have locally here in Eugene, but um, yeah. Well, my goal is to stay more more local. Obviously, this was a, a lead, the micro market that came through um, for a completely different location. I didn't have a vendingpreneur in the, that market yet, so that's why I took this remote opportunity on. But um, typically, yeah, I stay locally, and then you know we have vendingpreneurs all over the country that we're helping kind of that are going after their own side hustles wherever they live with their own vending routes. Okay. Um, And so cold calling other places locally, trying to expand, is that accurate? Absolutely. Okay. I'm like, I'm like looking around. I'm like, shoot, I could, because it seems like a cool, you know, gateway business for, especially for kids to get involved with. Like they could see like physical inventory. It's stuff that they already like you know, candy and snacks and chips and stuff. And, you know, to be able to kind of like touch and feel it versus like completely online. stuff. I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting one. It's like, well, shoot, maybe uh, you, you can be uh, interested in it. And the other interesting aspect is we mentioned, you know, there are routes for sale. And maybe I've been trying to come up with like a, you know, what's the difference between a side hustle and a second job? And the equity piece may be the biggest differentiator. He says, yeah, I'm working for profits, but I'm also working for ownership and equity in this route. Because like if for for every, you know, five hundred dollars a month I can add to the bottom line is well, you know, you know, what did, what do these things trade at? Like two with two two X uh, multiple or something on on uh, profits? On total revenue. Absolutely. So two X on revenue. On okay. total revenue. So for example, that fifteen hundred dollar a month machine, that one machine, yeah. that's that's twelve that's 18 grand a year in revenue, right? Well, I could turn around and sell that machine for 36K. And wow. So that's a, that asset piece of this, people don't even think. And you think of like all of the 
private equity groups that were snatch, you know, the like Cody Sanchez -y, um type. She talks yeah. about a lot and like Nick Huber around like storage and, and um, HVAC and plumbing, um, small mom and pop companies being consolidated by private equity. I think in the next year to, to five years, you're going to see that in vending because the cash flow is so stable and consistent that it's just on auto. Like I can predict within $150 every month what what each machine will do. Because it's food and water, it's like people need it to live. Yeah, it becomes kind of a, a habit for them. Like, to get exactly. something out of the thing. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, kind of back to the equity piece, people don't even think about that. And then I love your comment about the kids because I'm so bullish about this with my two daughters. And, and yeah, granted, one's four and a half months and one's going to be three this summer. So they're very super young to this. But there's no easier way to teach supply and demand and economy 101 than a vending machine to your kids. Like, think about it. Like I, Jason, the guy I was talking about earlier with, he bought 10, he bought two routes and he's up to 20 machines now. He yeah. literally has four kids and each one has their own machine they own and they have set on what they want to price, what they want to put in it. And it's like created this whole like family competition of oh, nice. whose machine's doing better and I mean, every one of those kids now has a college fund that's just monthly building. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a cool way to do it. Um, all right, um, we'll figure out how to make this uh, how to make this happen. Um, what, what are we missing? We haven't really talked about any sort of you know risks, liabilities, like ranging from uh, you know product defect, food poisoning. I don't know, or like the machine, like if somebody tips it over and breaks their leg, or like. Oh, what what am I not thinking about on the risk side? Yeah, so the risk with with regards to liability is, you know, you can cover that with insurance. But we have general. I was one of the things I always recommend is all these vendingpreneurs get their general insurance and all the kind of parameters and certificate of insurance for the locations and things like that. I think the bigger risk is those. Is that is that, that like route? Would you consider like a that general liability policy, like route wide or is like per, per machine, route per location? Wide. Route wide. And then okay. you might have to, some properties might ask for like a COI with that specific address, or you just have the general kind of umbrella policy for everybody. Um, okay. and then, and then I think the, the bigger risk is, um, this market is, um, going to be flooded here. I'm, I firmly believe in the next two, it's like e -com from 10 years ago. Those that have started building their routes and have more seasoned routes um, are going to get ahead of those people jumping into the market in the next three years. Like you better take, you know, if we look back on this episode in 2026, those that got in in 2024 are going to be way better off than 2026 because there's only so many locations. Right. And I think right now, um, if you're not keeping your machine stocked, people are coming after your location. And so that's the biggest risk is like okay. qual quality customer service. And now, and now you're sitting with a machine that you're like, oh crap, what do I, <laughs> now I got to yeah. find a new, no, I got to find a new home for it. Exactly. And you got young entrepreneurs now that don't trust the stock market. They don't trust the real estate market because they don't know what's happening with rates or prices or blah, blah, blah. So now they're like, well, I want to do what Mike did. And so like, it's, it's going to. It's just going to accelerate and accelerate. That's why if you get in it now, I think the multiple to buy routes probably two x revenue. Well, I know it is, but I think it could get up to like four x in the next two years. Yeah, is it typical to lock in um, like some sort of exclusivity contract? Like, hey, you know, mm -hmm. this is a, a two year term. You know, we'll be the exclusive vending provider for this location. So, like, to prevent you from getting kicked out or yeah. usurped yeah. by the next guy who calls yeah. them up. Absolutely, typical. Our standard agreements are three years. Okay. Okay. So you write that up. Our five-year agreements. If they didn't ask, like we'll we'll um, just push for five years and then see if if they push back and want to go to a three-year or one-year agreement. Okay. What's going to separate you from somebody who's cold calling these places who hasn't listened to this episode? Like, how can you stand out in terms of professionalism and just like how how, how are you going to get the gig versus uh, some uh, some other random person? I think the the way to stand out is to really play the amenity game. Don't even say the V word. Don't bring up bending. Play the amenities. People love luxury, modern amenities. So if you say the V word, they're going to think of that 
traditional machine from the airport from 20 years ago, where if you you bring up the amenity word, they're going to bring up the uh, what they saw in the terminal, Nick, the, the shelves with the self-checkout kiosk that looks like a mini 7-Eleven they can put next to their fitness center. Okay. Okay. I like that. That's a good, that's a good tip. Thanks for sharing that. Of course. What surprised you the most over the last few years? Is it, you know, the stuff that people buy? Is it the locations that have been a hit? Is it, I don't know, like I'll, I'll leave that open-ended, but any, uh, any crazy surprises? I am surprised at how consistent a cash flow is. Like I was kind of surprised at how you have a better um, chance of predicting your vending income for next month than you do of the person paying rent next month on time. Like the the predict predictability, if that's even a word, is like so spot on compared to some of my real estate um income streams and even like my Bitcoin mining and things like that. It's just uh so stable and consistent. The other side of it is it's a pure numbers game. That's what I love about it is like it's not get rich quick. So people that are like gonna pop do one pop in and think like at the end of the day, if you do 10 pop-ins and you get three out of 10, it's just like baseball. You're an all-star for, for that batting average. So that's kind of the goal is the long game and um, getting to the masses. Is there uh, a rule of thumb, you know, for, uh, you know, how many, uh, how many conversations you need to have before you get a yes? Or like, it sounds like it was pretty quick for you, but I don't know if that's yeah. the case with your students. I don't think there's that many conversations needed. It's, it's um, you know, if you hit that sweet spot where they already have a vending machine and it's not working, they want your service now because they got residents complaining about the current vending provider. Mm, okay. Or if you hit the sweet spot of the new build, that's like, I want modern, aesthetically pleasing looking machines and not traditional vending, and you're leading with the A word, like that is where you're going to be the shoe in favorite. Okay, you can get something that's like in the new construction or very like very fresh build phase where they maybe they don't have an existing provider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then just on the deliveries, cause like I'm just imagining like how big and heavy and bulky these things are. Like uh, with the new new purchase, like financing deal. I, yeah, I guess I can just request that they deliver it to the place that I've already signed up. But if you're buying used, like I gotta find a friend with a, a pickup truck, I gotta figure out how to move this thing. Like, has that? Have you run into issues there? Yeah, I mean, we definitely had. I had to move the machine that I got that uh, broke. I had to move it out, and it was a total. I mean, they're 700 pounds. It wasn't like you just get a little dolly and out the door you go. There's definitely some maneuvering around pallet jack type stuff. Uh, yeah. If you get a new machine, you get it delivered to the location. That's that's best case scenario and then the other case and hopefully it stays there for for yeah. three to five years yeah if you get a used machine you have them try to deliver it and pay an extra hundred bucks but if not i would totally hire someone on like craigslist gigs or something or task rabbit to to do that it'd totally be the 150 dollar 200 dollar tab be worth it to do that instead yeah, a recent guest in the furniture flipping niche uh, recommended a service called lug l-u-g-g -G. I don't know if they move anything that heavy, but she was using them to move furniture around the city. So uh, we'll, for what's worth, we'll throw that out there. Yeah, lug, L-U-G-G. -G. When you're leading with the amenities conversation, the uh, the locations, they're not necessarily asking for a piece of the pie. Is that on their radar? Or is that something that no, people ask for? Like, hey, I want, I want you know, 25% of your sales or something. Yeah, that's not on their radar unless you're kind of dealing with that probably class C or D type location. You know, if you think of like a super eight or even maybe like that, that oil lube joint that you go pitch those places, you know, that extra revenue would make a little bit more of a difference, but like these luxury apartments, you know, they're charging a premium to their residents. So they're not trying to, and they're also built by a corporate group. So the local people you're meeting with, they might ask you like, Hey, what's your revenues percentage? But the talk track around inflation with cost of goods of like, hey, Nick, you've been to the store recently. You know, avocados are no longer 50 cents, just like all the inventory and in this machine we're going to put in. So they don't want you to price jab their residents. So they're not asking for a kickback at all. And if they do, you just ask, okay, great. We can do a revenue share. We'll pass on part of the upfront cost of the machine to you. 
but we don't have budget for that. So oh, okay, okay. Sure. <laughs> That's right. So you can get around that, and it's pretty yeah. common to um, to not charge, you know, a like a square footage like rent. Like in the example of the ice vending, I think he was paying. Oh, I got to pay fifty bucks or two hundred bucks a month, like or something like to have the machine sit in this spot. Yeah. No, it's not like the kind of the parking lot retail space that the ice machine takes in. Okay. Yeah. Well, smaller, hopefully smaller footprint in that case. Well, what's what's next for you? Where do you want to go with this thing? Um, I just want to keep kind of building and, um, you know, I think they're the types of vending machines that are being built these days. And I'm constantly getting hit up every week about new kind of concepts like the Lego example we talked about earlier. I think, you know, the robotic arm coffee machines out of, you've probably seen them in SFO, but there's constantly new approaches coming that um, I'm always kind of keeping my ears to the ground on. Well, very good. You're helping other people get their own vending businesses off the ground at mrpassive.com. We'll link that up in the show notes. You can find Mike over there. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Yeah. Nick, first of all, thanks for having me. What a great show. And I really um, exciting to kind of see what you've built here. And then I think that the first tip is the people that that are hungry and have the entrepreneurial mindset, you know, the persistence, doing the pop-ins, you know, um, the people that really stand out, they are going to be the people that are going to build their routes the quickest. It's interesting to me, I just if some notes and takeaways just around, you know, like real estate, location, 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 but drawing that distinction between, you know, a 20% down payment for maybe... 300, 400, 500 bucks a month if you bought really well in cash flow. And of course, you know, the tax benefits and all, like all, of the, all the other things that come along with real estate. But you'd be able, being able to you know, generate that cash flow for, you know, in my mind, what seems lower, lower risk, lower overhead, you know, maybe lower headache. And yeah, you got to go stock the thing and hire somebody to do that once the, you know, revenue justifies it. But that makes sense. Is there a, um, is there a passive income? like a target that you're shooting for over the next 12 months or like, I just, I just want to keep building this thing and see where it goes. Yeah, no, I think I'm, I'm looking at it more um, like a lot of the other vending pre in our group around just generational wealth. So kids, college fund, kids, you know, 401k, like I'm just kind of trying to parlay and stack kind of every, everything for, you know, the kids and what they're going to get someday. So uh, that's that whole generational freedom that I'm really about. Very cool. Well, MrPassive.com, find Mike over there. It starts with one. You know, I think there's some economies of scale that go, you know, with having multiple machines, but it starts with getting that first yes. So I encourage you to go out and see what locations near you might be ripe for a new amenity, better amenities rather than uh, new, new vending machines. But a uh, big thanks to Mike for sharing his insight. I also want to thank our sponsors for helping make this content free for everyone. You can hit up SideHustleNation.com slash deals for all the latest offers from our sponsors in one place. And thank you for supporting the advertisers that support the show. It really does make a difference. That's it for me. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're finding value in the show, the greatest compliment is to share it with a friend. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show. Hustle on.